Good evening, folks. Sure is good to be back in the Lord's house tonight. I'm thankful for this opportunity to be in the Lord's house. Amen. Um, been a good day. It's going to get better. Brother Travis, would you lead us in prayer, please? Amen. If you would stand and get your All-American Church hymnal, let's turn to page number 67 at Calvary. Page 67. <clears throat> Years I spent in vanity and pride Caring not my Lord was crucified Knowing not it was for me He died on Calvary Mercy there was great and grace was free Pardon there was multiplied to me My sin I learned Then I trembled at the law I'd spurn Till my guilty soul imploring turned To Calvary Mercy there was great and grace was free Pardon there was multiplied to me There my burden so found liberty Number 356, Sweet Hour of Prayer. Page 356. Be 
wait for thee, sweet hour of prayer. Sweet hour of prayer, sweet hour of prayer, may I thy consolation share. Till from Mount Pisgah's lofty height, I'll view my home and take my flight. This Thank you. Good to be here, folks. I'm glad, thank God, that God's still God. And I'm still me, and without him I'm nothing. Amen. If you have your Bible, turn to the book of Hebrews with me this, to this evening. Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews 1 and verse 1. Hebrews 1.1, 1, 1, God, who at sundry times and in divers manners, spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son. Father, bless this holy book now. In thy name I pray. Amen. The Lord Jesus used to say, you've heard it said, but I say. You've heard it said, but I say. The law and the prophets till John, since that time the kingdom of God is preached, and every man presseth into it. What we have here is God's communication and manifestation to man. That's how it starts out. How he communicates and how he manifests himself. And absolutely, we're completely and totally dependent upon that. For the Bible says, canst thou by searching find him or find out God? If you could go to the very end of the universe, you'd never find him. There's no way to find him. He can't be found. If he could be found, that means he's in a location somewhere that makes him vulnerable. You can't find him, but he'll find you. He'll find you. I remember the Russian cosmonaut when he, uh, when he went up, now it's been, what, 50 years ago, he got up there and he sent back to Earth. He said, well, here I am in space and there's the Earth beneath me, but there's no God. Woman wrote back and said, open that door and jump outside and you'll find him real fast. <laughs> Oh, yeah, real fast you'll find there's a God out there. Today, William Shatner, I don't know if you know who this is, 90 years old, he went up in uh, spacecraft, and they call it uh, space tourism now. They weren't up there very long, but I watched it. I wanted to see what was, uh, was going to happen, and uh, up they went, and I don't know how long they stayed in orbit. The 66 miles seems like it was. The, they had to get above a certain area, a certain height, to be in orbit. And uh, I watched that craft go up and then uh, watched the, the videotape and it showed the earth, then it would show space. Then it would go back to the earth and then it would go back to space. And space was dark as the night, nothing to see. But the earth, you could see the earth beneath that spacecraft. Now, I'm not, uh, I don't know how much they could see. I know this is what we could see with the camera. But it was quite a thing. And uh, I watched them come down and land out there in the desert. And then they got out there to them. And Bezos interviewed William Shatner. And if you missed that interview, I would suggest you hear it. Because Shatner's 90 years old. He's been everywhere. He's done everything. I don't know that he's a Christian. I don't know that what he said he was trying to say to glorify God but he glorified God like you wouldn't believe. For here's what he said. He said, I wasn't prepared for this. He said, I've never seen anything like this in my life. He said, this beautiful thing below me, this globe out here, be beautiful blue. He said, there's a thin, thin air between it and blackness of space, between life 
and death. And then he started crying. He was overwhelmed. He was literally overwhelmed for, with what he saw, and nothing could have prepared him for it. And I thought to myself, you know what? This is, this is, this is what people need to understand. Unless you're ready and willing to receive something from God, you're not going to receive it. Now look at the space. Look up at space. It's black as night, but the sun's shining through it. Those rays from the sun are coming down to the earth. And when they get to the atmosphere of the earth, all of a sudden, everything lights up, right? Certainly it does. But space itself is black as night. It's dead, as he said. Why? Because there's nothing to receive that light as it comes down. You see, this is what the scripture talks about here in Hebrews chapter number 1 and verse number 2. Look what it says. Hath in these last days spoken unto us by his son, verse 3, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things with the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. What's that mean? That means that light came forth from the Lord Jesus Christ. All right? It was a light of the glory of God. Now this light, very clear, is not a reflection of God's glory. It's not like the moon. The moon has no light. It's no light source. Neither are we. But when the light comes down upon the moon, it reflects it for you to see. And the light that's coming forth from him, the Lord Jesus Christ, if it reaches to something that can receive it, then you're going to see the light. That's the point. And this light came forth. And when this light came forth, it was received. This is why we beheld his glory. The glory is the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. I think that's quite a remarkable thing. Because he's spoken to us in verse number one. He manifests himself. Now, this, uh, this spacecraft that went up today, I'm sure they've spent money advertising the, uh, advertising the spacecraft and all that. And it's, of course, nobody asked me to go up because I don't have that kind of money. You've got to have a pile of money, no doubt, to be able to buy a seat on that thing. But they will never have the advertisement that William Shatner gave them when he broke down and started weeping about the beauty of the creation that he was looking at. He had never seen anything like that in his life. This is a blue planet. I've seen it before, many photographs of it. It's a beautiful thing out here in the darkness and the blackness of space. And think of it as you look out. I don't care how far you look, it's nothing but dark. There's us. You have a star here and a star there that's burning and sending out light, but there's nothing to catch it. It's all dark out there. It's just this one little blue planet that you're stand, sitting on right now that is unlike anything else in the created universe. And it screams the question, why just one? Why just one? If all of this blew up from some big bang junk, billions and trillions and quadrillions of years ago, then billions of years doesn't mean a thing to these people. If it just exploded all of a sudden, how come just one exploded and showed up the way we are here? You understand that? This is the kind of thing, I mean, it really, I really, I could see what he was saying. I thought man would not have been something to look at. Think of all of the millions and millions and millions and millions of people that have lived on this earth and have never seen what these people saw. Well, four or five, I forget how many were in that thing saw today for just a brief period of time. And on this earth, while this spacecraft was going up and they were viewing this beauty below them, thieves were robbing, murderers were killing, uh, life go went on as it does. Let me tell you something tonight that'll help you in life. It has helped me greatly. A pearl in the snout of a swine will always be a pearl in the snout of a swine. The only thing that swine cares about is what it's going to eat. But if you have any kind of appreciation for anything of value whatsoever, you're going to appreciate that pearl. It's like the dog and the man standing on the edge of the Grand Canyon and the sun setting. And it's such a beautiful thing, 
beautiful beyond imagination. The man's looking at the Grand Canyon, trying to take in all of this splendor, and the dog's looking at the man. See the difference? This is the way it is with God's Word. If all you want from God's Word is something to move you emotionally, stir you up, some new thing that keeps you fired up, then let me tell you something. You've fallen into a trap. You're in a trap because you're going to be constantly looking for something new to keep you fired up. And it's not going to happen. That's the worst pit you ever got in your life. But if you'll open up the Word of God and let the Holy Spirit begin to open that book for you and show you the truths and the beauty that are hidden in the Scriptures, then it'll never be exhausted. And every day will be a new day. It'll never get old. It's a wonderful thing. Verse number three, who being the brightness of His glory. That's the glory shining forth. You remember when He went up on top of the mountain of transfiguration? Here's the sun shining then here's the sun shining. And the sun shining outshone the creation. The creator was much brighter than the creation. And so it is. I thought, you know, if, if we leave this world tonight, and we may, we don't know when we're leaving, and we go up through that, you suppose we'll see that as it recedes into the distance and that third heaven opens up and you see that that's there, folks? That third heaven is just as much there as this first one is that we're standing on right now. First one, unbelievable beauty. So the scripture says he was the brightness of his glory and express image of his person. In plainer words, the Lord Jesus Christ was the exact, exact manifestation of the essence of Almighty God. The essence of God is a spirit being. He's a spirit being. Nobody knows the essence of a spirit. But keep reading. Look at verse number five. The scripture says, For unto which of the angels said he any time, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And again, I will be to him a father, he shall be to me a son. It's comparison with angels. The book of Hebrews starts out comparing angels, Abraham, Moses, Melchizedek, people, high priest, all this, they're mentioned in the book of Hebrews. They have a place in that book. There's a reason for them being there. And this is very important. He never said that to an angel. So what he's saying is that the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the Son, is vastly superior to an angel. But look at the context a little closer. Verse 5, Unto which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my Son, this day have I begotten thee? Now let me tell you something. There are those who believe the Lord Jesus Christ came into existence when he was born 2,000 years ago. All right? This is what Charles Taz Russell taught, okay, back in the 1800s. And his followers are called Jehovah's Witnesses. They believe that Christ is a created God. According to this, it says, This day have I begotten thee. He was begotten of the Father in Bethlehem of Judea, but it was also begotten again by the resurrection from the dead. This begetting of the Son of God is each successive stage as he's exalted up to the Father. And he calls him, my son. Now look what he says in verse number 8. But unto the Son he saith, thy throne, O God. Now folks, if the Lord Jesus is not God, this is pure blasphemy. Nobody, nothing, anywhere at any time can be called God, but the one true and living God. Hear you, O Israel, the Lord your God is one Lord, one God. So when the Lord Jesus Christ is called God here, then it's very plain that he is the Almighty. And in Revelation 1.8 it says, Christ is the Almighty. Now you say, is this important? Absolutely it's important because it's far more important than you know who Christ is than to know if you're a Baptist. It's far more important than you know the deity of the Son of God than to, than to say you're a Protestant. If you get him right, about everything else will come right. It, really, it will. If you get him wrong, nothing else will be right. Amen. And religion is a man-made system of this and system of that. It's just a bunch of junk. Now, look at verse number 13. 
to which of the angels said he at any time, sit on my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool? Here we go again with a comparison with angels. No, he never said that. Here's what he did say about them, though, in verse 14. Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation? So what's a ministering spirit? Do you remember when the Lord Jesus was praying at Gethsemane? The Bible says the angels came and ministered to him. They did. Angels ministered to the Son of God. They're ministering spirits. In plainer words, they're sent to minister to us. Now you have the warning, be careful, that you don't entertain an angel unawares. Because you could. An angel is a spirit being, but spirit beings, folks, can manifest themselves. They can come across in appearance. And it makes it very interesting sometimes when you think, you suppose that could have been an angel? I've heard stories in the past more than once about meeting somebody and giving them help and turning around to do something. And when they turned back around, that person was gone. And zap, they disappeared. Say, oh, preacher, you don't believe in all that stuff, do you? I believe the Bible. I believe the Bible. Look at chapter 2 and verse number 6. Hebrews 2, 6. But one in a certain place, this is quoting the Old Testament, saying, What is man that thou art mindful of him, or the son of man that thou visiteth him? Now notice how man's brought into this. First is God, then the angels, and now man. Notice the progression. God, angels, Son of God, man. Now look carefully. <coughs> verse, number, uh, verse number five. And then verse number six. But one in a certain place testified, saying, now he's quoting the Old Testament again. What is man that thou art mindful of him, or the son of man that thou visiteth him? Why is he so important? Who is man? Now don't you note carefully, the Lord said to Adam, have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air. Today, the whole culture, the whole culture in this country and for the most part the world is trying to tear down man and raise up animals. And in the process, they are destroying the image of God. And this is where Satan shows up. For the Antichrist will come in the image of Satan, but it will be coming as a man. Just a man, like any other man. And they'll make an image to him and they'll worship him. Once again, they are tearing you down and they're raising the animal up. And you are not an animal. Don't ever let some, whatever he calls himself, teacher or whatever, tell you that you're an animal. An animal is a, is a biological creature. The word animal comes from the, the word animus. Animus is life. In other words, it's a creature with life. That's what an animal is. And so it's living and it's walking amongst us. All right? But that's it. Peter said, as natural brute beast made to be taken and destroyed. They are here for you. The animals were given for you. They're placed in this earth for you. You're not for the animal. The animal is for you. And if you get that order right, then you'll say to yourself, this bunch is crazy out here. They are crazy. They're crazy. They've lost it. They've gone off the deep end. And of course, when they do this, there's a moral thing involved with it. And that is if they pull you down to the level of an animal and raise the animal up to your level or even higher, they'll have you living like an animal. And that's what's happening. People are living like animals today. No holes barred. In your face. Everything goes. So, in verse number uh, 8, he said, Thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet. For in that he put all in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not put under him. But now we see not yet all things put under him. So, in plainer words, God has promised you something that has yet completely materialized. Partially, yes. You're to have dominion over the fish of the sea and the fowl of the air, but because Say sin entered in, then it affected your authority over this kingdom of this earth. And because of that, it affects your authority here. Look what he says. 
But now we see not yet all things put under him, but verse 9, but we see Jesus. Just like the man, we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor that he by the grace of God should taste death for every man. See that? We see Jesus. In plain words, mankind has not reached the goal that God intended for man to reach. He failed in reaching that. But we see Jesus. So he takes the focus away from man and he puts it on the God-man. Because there was a reason for the incarnation. There was a reason for Christ to come into this world as a man. God could have saved humanity and never been incarnate in flesh. But he had to be incarnate in flesh to do it the way he did it. And because he did it the way he did it, it justified him in everything he does. Because the judge of the whole earth will do right. Amen. He can only do right. And so the way he did it was by the way of righteousness. Look carefully. Made a little lower. For he, Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor that by the grace of God he should taste death for every man. Isn't that a wonderful thing? We're going to come back to that in a minute. Go to chapter number 3 of the book of Hebrews and verse number 1. Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the, now lo, notice what he's called here, apostle and high priest of our profession. The Lord Jesus Christ is called an apostle. What is an apostle? An apostle is one who is sent with a commission with the power and authority to execute that commission and do what the Supreme One has sent him for. So when the Lord Jesus was here in his earthly ministry for three and a half years, he says, whom the Father hath sent, referring to himself. The reason he said it that way is because the Lord Jesus had subjected himself to the Father to live under the Father's will and obedience. Therefore, he earned something during that lifetime that could not be earned any other way. And he earned it so that he can use it in the future. Now look carefully. Holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, who was faithful to him that appointed him, as also Moses was faithful in all of his house. Now he raised the word Moses in. Moses is in the Bible over 700 times. There are, and I don't know that anybody else has mentioned that many. Moses is from Genesis to Revelation. He's all over the Bible. He's everywhere in the Bible. And the Jews had the highest regard and still do for Moses. He wrote the first five books of the Bible, except the last few verses that refer to his death. He wrote the Pentateuch. He wrote the foundation for the Old Testament. If you didn't have Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, you wouldn't have Jeremiah and Ezekiel and Daniel and Hosea. What would that mean? You wouldn't know anything about that. Who are you quoting, you'd say? What's going on here? So he wrote the foundation. Moses was different. He wasn't perfect. He was a sinner like the rest of us. But Moses was absolutely and completely different than anybody else. And he says, notice carefully what he says about him. This man was counted worthy of more glory Inasmuch as he who hath builded the house hath more honor than the house. Now Moses was faithful in all his house. What's his house? His house is the house of Israel. That's the house of Moses. Moses was sent to Israel. He is the one who was sent to Egypt to deliver them from Egyptian bondage. That's Moses. Moses is the man who went to the top of Sinai and received the law from the hand of God. Moses was the man who became the intercessor between Israel and God. And Moses was the only one that could say to the Lord, you mark their name out, take my name out. And when Moses said that, God knew he had his intercessor. Because no man has any power with God until he becomes an intercessor. An intercessor is somebody that exalts somebody else above themselves. An inter like Mueller did over there in Great Britain. When Mueller started those orphanages, one time, he sat down at the table. They didn't have any food. George Mueller did. He was, George Mueller was one of the sorriest Germans that ever lived. Then he got saved. Now, that happens over and over again. And the people in Great Britain watched this man. They wanted to know, are you in it for yourself? You know, are you making money off of this? So he sits down at the table. 
And he's got these orphans gathered around him, and they don't have anything to eat. But he bows his head and he prays and says, thank you, Lord, for this food that we're about to partake of. And gave blessing to it, and a knock came to the door. I'm sure you all have heard that story before. Knock at the door, and there the food was brought up. I, I forget what he said. He said, I, I'm not able to make it to where I'm going today, or God told me to do this, or whatever. But the food was brought in, and they ate that day of the blessing of God. That was George Mueller. That was George Mueller. It's like David Brainerd. David Brainerd was the one in the, in the early years of, the, uh, of, uh, of, of Rhode Island and Delaware and New Hampshire and all of that. He'd go out in the forest and he'd pray. He'd like to get alone. So he'd go out there and he'd pray and he'd get on his face and he'd start talking to God and he would become so engrossed in his prayer. So, I mean, as far as he was concerned, nothing else existed. He was talking to God. And the Indians came up on him. I don't know who they were. Pequot, I think they said. Uh, eight or ten Indians, and they were going to kill Brainerd. They were going to do away with this white man. And he had his face buried in the ground. Here comes a rattlesnake slithering toward Brainerd. Rattlesnake. It slithers right up next to his head. And he's not totally unaware. Totally unaware. Had no idea what was there. He was talking to God. That snake stopped, paused. And then slithered away. And those Indians saw it. And as far as he was, they were concerned, he's a god. And so instead of killing him, they worshipped him. Why'd, ha why'd that happen? That happened because, uh, because he put God before his own life, before anything else. He wanted to commune with Almighty God, and he did. This is not an isolated case. He's every day out there. All day long in the woods, crying out to God and praying. And you know, I'll tell you the truth tonight. If you're not praying, you're playing. I hope you're praying. Because if you're not praying, if you don't pray, you play. They understood prayer and the value of prayer. So the Bible says that Moses was faithful in all his house. Okay. For this man was counted worthy of more glory than Moses. Why? Watch this. More glory than Moses, inasmuch as he who hath builded the house hath more honor than the house. For every house is builded by some man, but he that built all things is God. So Moses' house took care of Israel. But the house of the Lord Jesus Christ, in other words, his ministry, far surpassed Moses. It covered the entire world. This is why he could not be a priest after the order of Aaron. He had to be a priest after the order of Melchizedek. And Melchizedek shows up in the Old Testament before Israel was ever a nation. Melchizedek shows up 1900 B.C. And he shows up there as the, uh, as the as, as king priest over Shalem or Salom, Salem. So the Bible says in verse number four, every house is builded by some man. But he that built all things is God. For Moses verily was faithful in all his house as a servant. The word servant here is where we get the word therapeutic. It's therapon. There's two kinds of servants in the New Testament. One is a doulos. What's a doulos? That's a slave. That's mentioned many times, okay? A slave. He really has no choice in his matter. Like uh, uh, Onesimus, you read that over there. A slave is a slave. But this is a servant, not a slave. This is one who has been chosen to be a high elevation working inside the house of God and doing what God has called him to do. He's there where God placed him. Look carefully. Moses verily was in all his house as a servant. Verily was faithful in all his house servant for a testimony of those things which were to be spoken. Now watch this. But Christ as a son over his own house whose house we are. See, Moses is in the house. Christ is over all. So what we have here now, the writer of Hebrews is giving you, he's beginning to give you a comparison between Moses and the Lord Jesus Christ. He just gave you a comparison between man and the God-man. Before that, he gave you a comparison between God and the angels, the Lord Jesus Christ and the angels. You're getting these comparisons over and over again. But verse 6 says, Christ as a son over his own house, 
whose house we are, if we hold fast the confidence and rejoicing of hope firm unto the end. Now I'm going to give you the reasons for the incarnation. And we've got five of them right here in the book of Hebrews. Look at chapter 2, verse number 9. Hebrews 2, 9. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. That's one of the reasons for the incarnation. He tasted your death. Your death. You will not die like I die. Your life is not my life. I have my list of sins. You got your list of sins. When I came to God, he forgave me, he cleansed me, and he saved me and washed me in his blood. When we come to God, the same thing happens to every one of us. You're only saved one way. There's only one thing can wash your sins away. That's the blood of Christ. But he had to taste your death. That gets very personal. Your death. He should taste death for every man, not just the so-called elect, but every man. Notice the second thing the incarnation did. Chapter number 2 and verse 10. Hebrews 2, 10. For it became him for whom are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons unto glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. Captain of their salvation. He uses a military term in reference to the Lord Jesus Christ. The reason for that is in chapter number 2 and verse 11, that he might call them brethren. The Lord Jesus Christ becomes a brother. Why? Because we have the same father. We're in the same family. As far as the God-man is concerned, there is this relationship we have like that. Notice carefully. He's the captain of their salvation, perfect through sufferings. This literally means the one who goes before, lays the standard, and rules what happens. He's an officer. He's the, he's the one who is responsible. An officer gives orders, but he's also responsible for the ones that he gives the orders to. And note carefully, the Bible says the Lord Jesus is the author of eternal salvation. Remember, the captain of their salvation, perfect through suffering. This has to do with salvation. He's the author of eternal salvation. He didn't save you and turn you loose and say, now do the best you can and hold on to the end and it'll be okay. No, 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 no. This was drawn out from the mind of God. The author, notice carefully, not temporary salvation, but eternal salvation. This, where does this come from? It comes from Hebrews. And then he says in Hebrews that we are saved to the uttermost. Saved to the uttermost. That's a wonderful thing. You're not partially saved. You're completely saved. Absolutely. Your spirit's born again. Your soul's saved. And your body, if you yield your members as members of righteousness, can be sanctified, set apart, set apart into the master's, master's use. The body, is, as you well know, is a temporal thing. The best thing that you can get from the body is to yield it to servants of righteousness. But if you, if you don't and you obey the flesh and the lust of the flesh, then the Bible said if you live after the flesh, you'll do what? You'll die. So, you know, let's, let's get wise. <laughs> Keep my body and bring it into subjection. Lest that when I have preached to others, I myself should become a castaway. That was Paul's warning. He knew it. It, didn't, it has nothing to do with losing his salvation. It simply means set him up on a shelf. Put him aside. And uh, that he no longer would be useful for the Lord. So keep my body, my body, my body. He didn't say keep my soul. He didn't say keep my spirit. He said keep my body. So it, he, he's tasted death. Now here's the third reason for the incarnation. For both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all of one. For which cause he's not ashamed to call them brethren. Brethren. He is not a brother to the unsaved. He is not a brother to angels. But he is our brother. He's our brother. There's this filial relationship, this relationship that we have with Christ and with our Father, that he is one of us. He is one of my household, but he's not a sinner. See, there's the difference. We are. He's not. He never has sinned. Now, here's the fourth reason for the incarnation. For as much then as children partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through 
death, he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil. Death destroys death. Once death has taken what death can take, and then one is victorious over death, then death is finished. And the power of Satan is death. He's the father of death. He's the one who brings and uses death. Satan is a killer. Be careful. Your adversary of the devil is a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. He cannot lay a finger on you. Nothing on you. If you will plead the blood of Christ, walk in fellowship with the Lord, Satan cannot cross that line. I'm going to tell you something. You plead the blood. Let the blood be between you and the death angel that went through Egypt that night. Put it on your doorpost and your lintel. And Satan cannot cross the barrier of the blood. He cannot do it. He can't cross that. But if you allow the flesh, and we can do that. In 1 Corinthians 5, he said, Such in one, turn, turn, him, turn him over to the destruction of the flesh. Turn him over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. He'd had his father's wife. And that's very important. He had his father's wife. Turn him over to the destruction of the flesh that the spirit may be saved. See the difference there? Flesh destroyed by Satan. But the spirit cannot be destroyed. The spirit is safe. Hallelujah to God. Because I might lose my mind. Some people think I already have. Amen. But I might lose my mind one day. If I do lose my mind one day, I'm liable to do anything. I'm liable to say anything. Dementia will work you over. Alzheimer's is a horrible thing. And, uh, and, and I'll tell you, folks, I, <laughs> some folks with Alzheimer's, I just absolutely, they don't know who they are. They don't know their family. It's just, it's a terrible situation. But have they lost their salvation? No, no, because you're not saved because of your flesh. And your flesh cannot keep you saved. Amen. And then finally, the fifth reason for the incarnation, for verily he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. Here we have now Abraham introduced to us. We have God the Father, God the Son, angels, Moses, men, and now Abraham. What is it about Abraham? There was a blessing for the seed of Abraham. Who's that seed? The Lord Jesus Christ is the seed of Abraham. Amen. Galatians makes it very clear. He's the seed of Abraham. How so? In the spiritual sense, Abraham is the father of all them that believe. I'm a son of Abraham today. Not a son of Moses, a son of Abraham. Moses did not beget any of you. Abraham begat every one of you if you're born again. He even goes so far later on in the book of Hebrews to talk about how that Abraham, Abraham, when he paid tithe to Melchizedek, you remember that one now? That his great, 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 great grandson, Levi, who was the high priest, also paid tithe to, Abraham, to Melchizedek. He was in the loins of his great, great, great grandfather, which of course takes us to another step and say, what's that? Well, when I got married in, 19, in uh, 1969, 66, 69, I swear, man, I've been married 55 years, 66, wasn't it? Yeah, 66, yeah, I was still in the military, 66. I met this little girl and we got married and in 69, December the 18th, 1969, I had a little girl. All right, that's my little baby girl, 69, December the 18th. She's had three little girls, all right? Those three little girls will, in due time, have their own children, and their children, and their children, and their children, and on and on and on it goes, all right? But they're all in me right here. Because if I wasn't in the picture, they wouldn't be in the picture. It gets very complicated. Think about that. Just remove one part, just one part of that tree, and the tree's broken completely. Amen. Hallelujah. I'm glad, thank God, they didn't kill me. I had a funeral the other day, and it was your mother. 
And I told a couple of the people over there when I had the funeral, I said, my father, my grandfather, my grandmother, and my aunt, uh, paternal, all my Lawson family are buried no more than 30 feet from where we had that funeral. And after it was over with, I went over there and I looked at their graves. And in that area, there's four or five, I guess, different headstones with Lawson on them. Now, I'll bet you I'm kin. I mean, since they're all together in that area, I'm kin to a bunch of those Lawsons, no question about it, right? But it was Charles Arthur Lawson. Charles Arthur Lawson had within, had within himself me and all of my, and my daughter and all of my grandchildren. They were in him, all right? And the same way with you tonight. If you have children, you will pass down to them what God has given you, and they are of you, and you can't make it any other way than that. So you didn't come from a test. You'd say, well, I was a test tube. Make a difference whether you're a test tube baby or not. You have to have, you have to have the male and the female. The, they call them gametes. You bring them together, you've got a zygote, and from that you get an embryo, and on it goes. You have to have that, and you will not have a baby. I want to read this for you tonight. This is the last thing that I'll say. Mr. Kilpatrick had a most unusual homecoming. He was 83 years old. They found him sitting in his chair as though resting. He had gone to be with his Savior and Lord. On the floor at his feet was a sheet of paper. On one side of the paper he had written. This is what he wrote right before he left. Just as thou wilt, Lord, this is my cry. Just as thou wilt to live or die. I am thy servant, thou knowest best, just as thou wilt, Lord, labor or rest. On the reverse side of the paper, in a hurried scrawl, was a second verse. Just as thou wilt, Lord, which shall it be? Life everlasting waiting for me, or shall I tarry here at thy feet? Just as thou wilt, Lord, whatever is meet. And God put his hand on his shoulder and said, that's a good way to leave. Come on, I'm taking you home. And he left. <laughs> now, can you think of a better way to leave than that? No, I can't. I can't. Up until the last breath in his body, he was glorifying God, praising him for his life. God was still God. Father, bless your word. Thank you for this opportunity to come tonight in that presence. In Jesus' sweet holy name I pray. Amen. Amen. Let's see, now Van Caldwell. Van Caldwell is going to be singing for us tonight. Well, my wife's coming. I'd just like to say that I'm thankful that when things go wrong in my life, whether it's uh, things I cause or things, you know, caused from the outside, I'm just thankful that when I get before the Lord that uh, He can make things better. And uh, I just thank Him for that. He's, uh, he's been awful good to me. I thank Him for that. <coughs> situations that tug of war at me all day long I struggle for the answers that I need but when I come into his presence and all my questions become clear and for that sacred moment all
of the King. Through His love the Lord provided a place for us to rest, a place to find the answers in the hour of distress. Now there is never any reason for you to give up in despair just slip away and breathe his name he will surely meet you there in the presence of jehovah god almighty prince of peace Troubles vanish, hearts are mended in the presence of the King. That's beautiful. Amen. We this is one well, prayer meeting night. I might have a special request tonight. We'll take that and pray here in a minute. Anybody have a request? Yes, sir. Yeah, amen. Yeah. Amen. Okay, brother. Yes, sir. Brother, amen. All right, anybody else? My daughter in law, she's been, she had COVID for probably three weeks now. She's in the hospital in uh, Cincinnati, and uh, she got a, a machine. Her lungs, but she really needs prayer. And I appreciate it. I'm so thankful for prayer. So if I tell you, I wouldn't be here tonight if it wasn't for prayer. Amen. God is, He will answer our prayer. Yeah. Amen. And, uh, I, when I was a young girl, six, uh, I was six and a half years old, I was dying of leukemia. And God healed me. And I'll never forget it. No. God is, he's a healer. Praise yeah, he's a healer. <laughs> Amen. All right, anybody else? Yes, sir. Is he the one that's the doctor? No, he's uh, that's Molly's brother, Charles. Charles. Molly's the middle. He's the middle. Right. I knew this. She's taking care of my mom. She's got dementia. 
Okay. Amen. Amen. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Yeah. It's really developing. It's developing. Anybody else? Yes. Spoken request? Brother Beck, lead us in prayer. Would you do that, please? Thank you, brother. All right. Well, let's stand up tonight. We'll have prayer and we'll let you go. Where's that at, brother? Visitors from Texas? Right here. Good to have you. played basketball against Bearden High School a long time ago. Yes, sir. We I respect you. Yes, sir. Louisiana? Yes, sir. All right. Well, good to have you folks with us tonight. Yes, sir. Texas and Louisiana. God bless all of you. Get by and shake hands with them. Father, thank you for tonight, for your word, time we have together. Keep our folks safe, Lord, as they travel. 
In Jesus' name, amen.